Welcome again to our writing series. We are focused on writing the back end today. Thank you for joining us. Okay, slides are working. So um, to start off, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Tiara Worsley. I'll be your facilitator today. Um, why am I facilitating? Um, I have had the opportunity to do a few publications. So I've learned a lot about writing the back end. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where a lot of my research focuses on um, informal STEM education within maker spaces and like with um, community organizations, boys and girls clubs, things of that nature. And I also serve as the co-chair for the NARST Graduate Student Committee. And I have had the opportunity to have some publications within the Journal of Environmental Education, the Journal of Effective Teaching in Higher Education, the International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches, Education Sciences, Journal of Science Teacher Education, the English Journal, and Innovations in Science Teacher Education. So hopefully that qualifies me to talk to you about this. So just to kind of give you an overview again, we are currently on session four of the six-part writing series. So next week will be our last week. We have a session on the 7th and on the 9th. Um, I know many of you have been wondering as I've been seeing the emails about them, we will record these sessions and we are aiming to have them available on the NARST YouTube uh, within about two to three weeks after we finish the series, just so we can have a moment to review the videos, edit the videos, and then make sure that they are uploaded. Okay. And to get started, what are we going to discuss today? So we are going to focus on the back end of the paper when you're setting it up for publication. So, um, oh, I accidentally went back. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the findings, going through the discussion, the implications, and the conclusion, as well as I will provide some writing tips that I like to engage in when I'm writing and maybe they will help you as well. So to tell you about the flow of the presentation, so throughout this entire thing, feel free to drop all and any questions in the chat. I do have it open, so I will see it. The first hour, we're gonna focus more on kind of the content, really get digging into what is the back end of the paper. And then the second hour, we'll use that as like some actual writing time so you can stay on if you would like and we'll have an hour where you can ask further questions or if you just want that accountability you can stay on and we can serve as one of your writing groups for the day and just to give you a disclaimer so a lot of the information that i've used to set up and to set up this presentation um, one is from my own experience in writing the background I mean, writing the back end, but also I was able to participate in the um, JARST Early Career Reviewer Pathway Program. And what that was is um, NAR sent out an email saying that they were looking for people to participate in this. And what you did as a part of this program, um, it was really quick. Um, maybe, I would say maybe it was um, a month or two. And what we did is um, JARST sent us an article that it, it had already been published, but they sent us like kind of the first round of when that article was submitted. And what we did was we kind of went through that paper and it gave us an opportunity to review it. And then everyone who was accepted into that, we all kind of went through our feedback together. And um, once we discussed that feedback, we were able to talk it over with um, Dr. Felicia Morbensaw, who is the co-editor of JARS. She was able to explain some of um, what, the, what the reviewers had seen in this article, and then also looking at what we had identified as feedback within the article. And um, they gave us some helpful tips. So I'm drawing on a lot of what I learned from that 
again, as well as my own experience. So if you are ready, we'll get into it. I also want to add, um, after I kind of do each section, I will open the floor up for questions. So if you want to unmute yourself, that's fine. If you just want to type your question into the chat, that is fine as well. So it'll be a little, little bit more of a discussion-based type of presentation. Okay, so the findings. Why do the findings matter? So the findings are where you tell the reader what happened in your study. So as people are kind of reading research and they're, they're learning about the possibilities of what they could do, they're using your findings as a way to gain perspective. And what that can mean is they could, you know, look at your findings and use that as a resource for them where they might pull, you know, possible activities they could implement or they could get other tools from what you have provided as findings. So with that, you know, you wanna be specific and tell a full story of what you did. So with your findings, they should always be in alignment with the rest of your paper, with the front end, um, specifically your methods. So um, let's say if you said your method was you're presenting a case study, that's fine. But when you um, get into writing out your findings, if you're pulling from a public data set, then that doesn't really match up. And so you want to make sure that the method you're using is also in alignment with what you are producing in your findings. And also your findings, it should address the problems and the questions or the hypothesis that you have presented in your front end because it should just be this like through and through tra uh, trajectory. And then also if you're writing more of a theoretical piece, um, for example, like a literature review in your findings, we would expect to see more citations since you're drawing specifically from previous studies. Um, Usually there aren't as many citations in findings if it's an empirical piece, just because you're telling about what you did in your research study. So if your paper is more theoretical, you would probably have more citations. So to kind of explain, you know, what would these, um, what would these findings look like? Um, I provide an example and the examples I'm providing are from papers I've written. And it's not so much for me to say, go read my papers. It's because I was actively involved in that writing process and then it made it to the publication process. So I can just talk better to, you know, what our group's, you know, conversation around how to improve our back end was. So that's why I'm using my papers. So here I have an example, and this is why it's important to kind of be specific. So here I have written, and as I read this, if you, if any questions pop up or you're thinking, oh, I would like to know more about this, or, you know, you just have some general feedback about it, um, do drop it in the chat so we can discuss it. So for example, we have across the pub, uh, and sorry, let me back up again. So this paper that I have listed here, this little snippet, it was part of a scoping review of the literature on, it was looking at people, I mean, papers who were using mixed methods as their design, as well as they were using critical race theory as their framework. And this paper originally was a class assignment where we had to do a literature review. And the group I was working in, we actually built on that class paper and we turned it into this publication. So what I'm presenting is part of a literature review. So we have across, across the published articles, utilizing a sequential design, some articles used disaggregated quantitative data along racial lines to account for race and racism. A few articles involved the use of secondary data sources and one involved the use of longitudinal survey data. So here, yes, we did tell what we did, but as you're kind of seeing it or you heard me read it, it's probably leaving you wanting to know more. You probably want a little bit more detail so that you can create a better vision in your head of like what happened during the study. So this would be an example of, yes, you've told us what you've done, 
but there's room to improve it and make it more specific. So what we actually published was across the 10 published articles utilizing a sequential design, five or 50% used disaggregated um, quantitative data along racial lines to account for the centrality and intersectionality of race and racism. Three involved the use of secondary data sources, such as the school disciplinary data by Enema from 2019, state educational data from Gibson 2019, and census data from Henry et al. 2017. And one involved the use of longitudinal survey data. So if you look at the difference between those examples, you can see how in the second one, we've provided very specific details to enhance the findings. So now you're not guessing as much about what happened. So you know we're looking at 10 articles. Um, we're telling you that half of them, again, five, they were using quantitative data that was central to and because we're looking at critical race theory in this one, we're saying that they're specific to centrality and intersectionality of race and racism. Then we're telling you that three articles involve the use of a secondary data source, which, which in this case counted as a public data source. So they pulled, you know, school disciplinary data, which is just this huge thing of like everyone who has had any form of disciplinary action. They use state educational data, which is kind of like, you know, anything from, you know, your public school records. And then there's the census data, which, you know, that happens, I believe, every 10 years. And they just give you like, they tell you like demographics, cost of living, things of that nature in these like very large data sets. And then we tell you that one of these articles involved the use of longitudinal survey data. So we're just, we're telling, we're, so in this first first example, yes, we do tell you the findings, but in the second example, as you can see, and I've kind of highlighted in purple, this is where we go in and give those like really specific details. And I just want to pause there, see if there's any, oh, actually I have another example. I'll do it next, sorry. <laughs> so then here we have um, an empirical example. So um, for this paper, this one was one where we, um, we focused on fostering joy in making. And I shared a vignette about two girls that were in a program. And I shared about their process of navigating the design of their game that they were coding. And I co-wrote this with someone else. And so as an example, I have the focus of the STEM program that year was coding with the use of Scratch and Ozobots. Ozobots used a color coding system on paper, and they, it can also be used with a coding program online. And then I explained, Scratch is an online program created by MIT where users can create games and share them with an online community. So with that, um, again, similar to that first example, what we have here is yes, we I did explain what happened, but again, it's very vague with the details. So how to improve that? So one, I said the focus of Southeast Green Club, and the reason I specifically named that is because as I said, I was um, writing this with someone else and I wanted to differentiate, you know, which club we were talking about. So I named it Southeast Green Club. And at that time, I tell you the years that we did this, it was 2018 to 2019, the focus was coding with the use of Scratch and Ozobots. Ozobots are tiny robots that use a color coding system on paper by using a combination of colors that include red, blue, green, and black. And it can also be used with a block-based coding program online called ozoblockly.com. Scratch is an online block-based coding program that was created by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, i.e. MIT. And this is where users can create games and share them with an online community. So again, here, I just, I really dug into the details. So one, you know, we might have someone who's 
um, looking for resources or tools that they can use in STEM. So now that I've kind of explained what an Ozobot is, it's a tiny robot. I've, and um, I've explained what Scratch is. It's a block-based coding program, which, you know, the block-based programs are more commonly used with kids. You know, I'm giving these specifics where someone might say, oh, okay, that could be a tool we use or an activity we bring in because now I'm giving a little more detail about what those tools are and how they work. Um, the combin using the combination of colors, like now you know that when you're working with the Ozobots and you're using the paper coding, you know, you use one of these four colors, you're going to use red, blue, green, and black. And then I'm also telling you that um, the Ozobot has its own block-based coding program. And then, you know, if someone doesn't just immediately know what MIT is, you know, I'm telling them it's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So this is a way where you can just kind of like get more specific to really build on your findings and make sure you um, explain very well what happened. Because basically what you're doing is similar to when you're reading a book. As you read a book, you create a scene in your head. So it's very similar with your findings. As people read your findings, they're kind of recreating what you did. So here I will take a pause and see if anyone has any questions or anything they want to drop in the chat, uh, if there's anything specific about just that findings section. I don't think there's too many people. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, that's also fine. Getting better with my wait time. <laughs> this is something that uh, you would be writing in the findings section, right? This much details. Yeah. So the version that has the purple text, that <laughs> is what we wrote in the findings. Okay. Yeah. So even in the, even though you are giving, um, probably you might be giving all this Southeast Green Club and uh, the year and everything in the introduction, like probably mm -hmm. the background part, mm -hmm. and still you would be taking that and writing it in the findings. Yes. So um, if we're being honest, sometimes people, I'm included, they're lazy mm -hmm. when they're reading, they read it and they, then they kind of forgot. So it's just kind of, reappointing people to what I already said, because yes, I did explain the Southeast Green Club in the method section where I discussed the research context. I told them about this club. I told them it was 2018 to 2019, but you know, we've all been there. Sometimes we just blank on what we've read. So I'm just reiterating again. So as you read my vignette, it was in the Southeast Green Club and it was during 2018 and 2019. And it's it's okay to say say the same thing again, just to remind the reader, just because, you know, we're just reading so much. It's just very easy that it can leave our mind. And then two, I'm, I'm writing with someone who is also going to talk about their space. And, you know, we have two different pseudonyms for our spaces. So I want to be specific in when I'm talking about um, the space I work in versus the space that she works in. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Another question? Uh, a question, madam. Mm -hmm. uh, in a, for example, in a case study where uh, a very small number of participants is involved, mm -hmm. uh, where each one of them gives uh, a response. Mm -hmm. um, how specific can can one be? Uh, can one be? Is it possible to? Is it okay to um, to give the individual responses, or you can still group them? Say two people out of ten said this, three said this. Mm -hmm. Which one is the right way? Yeah, so um, great question. That's going to segue into my next session. So um, I mean, the next section. So um, two ways to answer that. One, I don't think you're ever being too specific because people just love details because 
it's almost like it removes, you know, the wondering of what happened. So you can always be as specific as you want to. If um, I love using quotes, so quotes are a great thing to add in um, because again, that's data. The stronger your data is, the um, more evidence you have in your findings. And then sometimes if you have, you know, if you're looking at a smaller number, like three to four people, and you want to cover like a scope of something they said, you might, you also might implement a table that kind of covers what everyone said about one thing. So for example, um, if you interviewed them and you said, you know, what do you think of this program? And everyone gave something specific. You might set that up in a table, which segues perfectly <laughs> into the next section where um, I kind of talk about tables, figures, and appendices. So um, it's a great way to enhance your data. Um, it's great for um, sharing about artifacts that were created or um, artifacts that you went in with. And it also allows you to like dig deeper into a snippet of data. And sometimes it's just, and it, it's just easier to look at. So um, I've used tables, like um, if I have a group and there's maybe what, four to five participants that I'm going to tell you about, I might set them all up in a table and tell you who they are. And I might say, um, Josh is one of our teachers and he's in a rural setting where he teaches ninth through 12th grade. And then I might go to the next person and say, Mary is teaching fifth grade and she focuses on environmental science. So it's just another way that you can present your data that can like help people just visualize what it is that you're um you're telling them about. Um, another thing to make note of is make sure that the visuals that you're using are in alignment with your data. So um, if you are talking about what a kid has made in a program, and you know, you're know you very honed in on this artifact they have made, but then maybe your picture is of you know, the teacher doing something that might not be, you know, that, that kind of might feel disconnected. So like, make sure that whatever you're referring us to look at is directly related to what it is you're writing in your findings. And then the next thing is kind of use appendixes, appendices if necessary. Um, I don't use appendix, the appendix part too much, um, but some people do, it depends on what data you're presenting. So um, for example, in my dissertation, I used an appendix to show my interview protocol because I asked, um, I asked everyone, you know, kind of, um, I had one protocol I had created to ask youth. And so in my appendix, I put the actual protocol, but um, yeah, there's a bunch of other things you can include, but having, having these um, help supplement your findings and your research as well. And to kind of show an example of that in that, um, that mixed methods paper we did, um, because there were so many articles, like we gave a lot of tables to just kind of reiterate what we were saying in those findings. So this table tells the design type and the notation. And, um, you know, we tell them, was it convergent? Was it exploratory sequential? Was it explanatory sequential? We go into the design notations. We give those specific details that we've already covered in our findings, but, the, you know, we're just enhancing it to show people, just give them something else to look at. And then, here, um, usually if you have an image, they'll count it as a figure because in the other paper, I'm talking about Kia's experience with coding. I put the picture that Kia used because Kia wanted to put herself in her game. And so I'm telling people as she was creating her game, she wanted to put herself in the game. And this is exactly what she put in her game to represent herself. So again, it just... It just gives, it helps people visualize even more like what's happening. It's like recreating that story in your head. So next is the discussion. So the discussion is kind of where, you know, you think about what do you want to leave people with? Like, what do you want them to remember about 
this paper overall. Um, you should highlight emergent themes that are showing up. Um, it will clearly specify the contributions of the study, and you should highlight how the findings either support or they differ from or expand on ideas that are already in the literature. And um, usually I like to kind of like use, when I'm writing findings, I kind of like to hi highlight the emergent themes as like subheadings. So then when I refer back and bring in, you know, the findings data and build off what I've written as a in the literature, you know, people are aware of what I'm saying is a theme and I'm providing enough evidence of to support that theme. Um, things to be cautious of is don't bring in new information or data in your discussion. Everything that gets mentioned here should have already been touched on at some point previous to the discussion. Um, for example, all the literature that you draw from in your literature review, that can be brought into your discussion. We shouldn't see a new citation at this point that we haven't seen before. Um, for example, someone mentioned case studies. If your case study revolves specifically around like Jamar, Tyler, and Marcus in, um, in the discussion, I shouldn't then hear about Sarah because I haven't heard about Sarah before. So just make sure you're concise with, you know, what you're presenting. And then also like activities. So I write a lot about STEM activities. And so like here, I've mentioned, you know, using Ozobots and using Scratch. So then if I get to an activity, I shouldn't then bring in, yeah. And they did scribble bots because that's a completely new activity that hasn't been mentioned before. So um this is where you really like kind of like tell people what you want them to know, why you think that data you just presented to them and the findings is important and what you really want to stick with them as they move forward. And to give an example, I pull from the from our literature review piece. And so in our discussion, we kind of led with the publications included in this scoping review unveiled ways in which institutionalized racism functions just below the surface. However, several missed opportunities were noted with regard to the transformative impact of critical race theory dash mixed methods research. We found weak connections between the quantitative and qualitative findings in critical race theory, which led to articles that lacked depth and complexity of analysis, providing fewer potentially transferable details and the telling of less compelling stories. So in this example, you see where we're kind of identifying, you know, missed opportunities. We're highlighting some of those emergent themes. And one thing to um, be careful be careful of when you're going into the discussion is remember that you are not attacking other people's work. You are critiquing the work. And that's just the nature of the field. Um, it's okay if you don't agree with another article. It's all in just how you how you explain how you want to build on it and also make sure it's backed up with evidence that you have provided. So here our evidence is the literature that is already out there because it's a literature review. And you see, we said that the articles lacked the depth and complexity of analysis because what we were seeing is that, um, you know, the articles, you know, some of the articles would say we're using mixed methods data, but they may only talk about the qualitative piece of that data and they don't really discuss the quant the quantitative part. So that's that's where we were building our, you know, our discussion of is, you know, we're seeing these missed opportunities. However, to build on what's out there, we think that maybe they should look into these topics. So we're not, you know, attacking work. You're critiquing it and offering suggestions. Any questions here? Uh, one here yeah just maybe more more clarity on the point that uh in the previous slide that said no no new information or 
data in the discussion, just more clarity on no new information. I want to believe that discussion of findings, discussion uh, discusses the, the findings, the way they were presented in the previous chapter, and also um, in relation to what other studies have, have brought in the field. So when we say no new information, a new, no new data should be mentioned here. Uh, what exactly do we mean? Yeah, so what I mean specifically here is that, you know, you by the time you've gotten to the discussion, you have introduced your study and why we need that study. You have you have chosen what literature you want to present in your literature review. You have told us what your framework is going to be. You've told us your methods, um, how you designed the study, and you have given us some findings. So you've already given us information to look at. So let's say you've given us A, B, C to look at. What you don't want to happen in the discussion, aside from like building your points, like your points, your emergent theme, that will that will be what you hone in on. But you don't want to bring in something that's completely new. Like if if you have cited, um, if you've used like mainly fifteen citations throughout the whole thing, and then you introduce a new citation that wasn't mentioned before, that would be like something new. And it'd be like, oh, well, what is this citation doing? Because you're building the case and you want to be consistent. And then in your findings, like, um, like if you were doing that case study, if you're telling me in your findings that you're focusing on persons A, B, C, and this, you know, everything is about person A, B, C, and then in the findings, you tell me about person M, that's somebody completely new. I'm gonna wonder, well, who's person M? They haven't mentioned them before. So whatever comes in your discussion, you should have already given us something to build on it. So that's what I mean by like, no new information should be there. Cause here is where you're gonna, you're gonna tell me what you would want me to take away from this. So that's what I mean by new information. If there's a citation that you really feel should be in your discussion, and I mean, this may happen as is the nature of writing, like let's say a new paper comes out and you're like, oh, that needs to be in here. You can add it in your discussion, but if it's in your discussion, it also needs to get added to your literature review. So you can you can add more, but it shouldn't, I mean, like it shouldn't just be completely a new concept in your discussion because now you're now you're telling me you're building on everything you've already told me and it's like okay I can all the dots should connect so that's what I mean by that are there any other questions or chat uh so I have one question yes so in the um, so I often wonder like how long each of my section would be uh, mm -hmm. in terms of length. Yeah. Uh, so in, based on like a comparative way, can you tell me like, so does mm -hmm. discussion be much lesser than the findings? But I have seen papers where findings are short, but there is like a huge discussion session. So which yeah. one is the advisable one? Um, I would say, I think it, I think it depends on what you were going to present. So um, yes, I agree. And I've noticed that like if people have really long findings, then the discussion mm -hmm. usually is a little shorter or if their findings are shorter, then their discussion is longer. And I think it's all in what are you going to present? Because again, you just want to make sure that you've specified and you have provided enough evidence for everything that you're building into. So I would say, you know, if you have four pages worth of findings, then yeah, maybe your discussion won't be as long, but it's not to say that it has to be, sh it has to be short because your findings are long. The main thing is, did you say enough to get the point across? And if, if you, if you feel uncertain, then you would just add more. And again, this is why you go through the review process, because if your reviewers feel that, you know, more could have been said like they'll just let you know that like I I see your discussion point 
point here. However, you know, could you say more about da 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 da? Usually they'll let you know. So I don't think there's a clear rule on how long. I just think you should have enough information for however you're building the case. Okay. which goes into someone's point when they said, how much is too much? This is why usually, I mean, as long as it's, you have bounded it, like um, if you say I'm focusing on data from 2018 to 2019 amongst three, three people, as long as it's in that bound, I don't think you're sharing too much data. Then we're gonna go into the implications. So um, there are always implications because no study is perfect. So implications explain the limitations of the study. You just clearly identify them. You also tell about what the potential avenues for future research could be. And this is where implications gets tricky because some papers will incorporate implications into the discussion and or into the conclusion. So some I'm sure you've seen papers where implications get wrapped up into the discussion or it might be its own section or it goes into the conclusion. Usually it's somewhere in there. But um, really what you wanna highlight is kind of what limited you during your study. And remember, this is not a point of failure. Anything can happen. So um, an implication could be, you know, you went into the study, you wanted to look at 25 people, maybe only 10 of them consented. That was a limitation of your study. Um, one that most people have most recently was um, the COVID-19 pandemic. It kind of cut everyone's research where it was. So that was an implication for many. Um, maybe originally you were looking at youth doing work, but as you were working with youth in a classroom, you thought, oh, you know, actually, I think we need to look more into the teachers. I think that could be beneficial. That's fine. That's an implication. Um, thinking about what did you struggle with, um, that can be an implication. Um, like I know uh, a big one may be if you're working in a school, let's say you're working with five teachers, if one of your teachers quits and then another teacher gets a new job and then one of your teachers is so overwhelmed that they just drop out of the study and then, you know, maybe the other two, now they have to encompass the work of the other three that dropped out. So, you know, that shifts what's happening with your teachers. That's not to say you you did bad research. It's just, again, it's an implication. It, it's just what happened and that's fine. You should just let people know this is what happened. Um, maybe your funding ended <laughs> before you could get to the next idea and you couldn't get to it. Um, anything can happen. So these implications aren't ways to like say that, well, this is how my study was bad. It's just to literally say, this was just a limitation of what I could do for X, Y, Z reasons. Uh, and to show an example. So um, here we wrote implications for STEM educators seek to explore how access and the choice to innovate on one's own terms is a freedom practice to consider STEM learning as a freedom space that actively counters anti-Blackness requires moving from trauma-centered narratives to imagining from perspectives that are not limited to the confines of STEM and making as defined by the dominant culture. So here we have an implication section from our paper. Our implications was actually included in our discussion section, but you see that we specifically named it. We said, but here are our implications. And then we listed out, you know, who we think should be considered. You know, this is an implication for STEM educators. You know, what do we think they need to consider in the future? We think they need to look closely at, um, you know, actively countering anti-Blackness and what that looks like. But also they need to move from these trauma-centered narratives and focus more on imagining from perspectives. Like we think this would be a great next step for, for the STEM educators. So um, again, if it gets roped into another section, just name it as, you know, these were my implications. 
because again, it happens in papers. Any questions here? And then moving into the conclusion. So your conclusion will address the problems, questions, or hypotheses that you have already named. Again, no new information is here. Um, your conclusion is supported by your data. You're making a convincing argument for the importance and significance of your study. It is a summary of information that has been covered and also what thoughts do you want to leave people with? So if you think about your the entirety of your paper, this is where you go back out to the big picture. So when you're writing, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a hourglass. You start out big picture. Here's the problem. Here's why we need to address it. You get very specific about what you did in your research, and then you funnel back out to your conclusion. So um, what you focus on here is just, you know, nicely closing out your article. Again, this is where you're going to highlight some of those things that you've probably already said about three or four times throughout your article. But again, that's fine. This is just where you're building your conclusion. And this is where you send people off where after they've read, they just kind of sit with it. So an example, how we closed out our um, literature review Again, all this information was said earlier, but we said it again. This exploratory scoping review demonstrates the potential that critical race theory and mixed methods research truly has in addressing the, in the integration challenge. Throughout this scoping review, the results provided depth and detail, making it difficult to ignore the centrality of race in US educational institutions. However, the relatively low number of publications that met our inclusion criteria leads us to believe much might be learned by expanding this review into a larger mixed, method, mixed methods research study as a means to explore more broadly the impact that critical race theory and mixed methods research infused methodology has on expanding theoretical and empirical tools to assist in fostering equity, disrupting systemic inequality and deepening learning. So again, we said all of this earlier in our paper, but we just mention it again to just kind of close people out, remind them again of what they read. Any questions here? Sorry if y'all hear that beeping. I think they're grabbing the trash outside. No, no question. If you do have them, you can still drop them in the chat and I'll be here for that second hour. So if something comes to your mind, you can definitely um just check in with me. But um, oh, lastly, I always like to give some tips. So um, some tips about writing your papers. One, authorship. Discuss this beforehand. Who's going to write what? Um, discuss, this, discuss the sections before in your research group and understand that things may shift throughout the process. So again, anything can happen. Um, maybe one of the students that was working on this, they leave, they're no longer in the doc program. They drop it okay, we have to shift who's writing what. Um, maybe, you know, we're all docs, we're all, we've all been grad students, you know, it happens. Maybe someone says, okay, well, I'm going to be first author now, and this is what's going to happen. That might happen. This is why you kind of discuss authorship first, and then you try to get it written down, what everyone's doing. So all of you can know where you need to work and you don't, um, you know, waste too much time doing the same things. 
Um, and two, authorship, it can just be, sometimes it can be a complicated just conversation to have. So it's always best to just get it out of the way first. But then at the same time, it can just shift throughout the process. And it doesn't always mean it's something bad. You know, one time I got really overwhelmed and I said, I just cannot write this. There's too much going on between classes and everything. So I asked if someone else could take it on and someone else did. Again, no problem. Um, next, I would say start with the section that you feel most comfortable with. So for me, I always like to start with findings. Um, I just do. I feel like it's the easier part, but that's my opinion. Um, my friend, Dr. Rashida Likely, she always says, you know, writing is not linear. It's not this cycle. It's not the hamster wheel cycle. You know, just sometimes you go in different places and that's fine. Um, I say writing is progress, not staring at it. So if you're really struggling to write an introduction, as I do, and you've sat there for two hours and there's still nothing, maybe go to a different section. This is why I start with findings. Because um, truth, truth be told, I like to go findings and then discussion. Then I like to go back to methods. And then I'll go framework. And if I'm lucky, someone else will take over for the intro and the literature review and the conclusion. <laughs> this is why I like the writing groups. But, you know, know what works best for you because even the little, even the smallest amount of writing is still progress because we can help when there's words on a page. We can't do anything when it's all in your head. Um, focus on small sections. Don't get too overwhelmed. Maybe you don't want to say that, yeah, I'm just going to write all my findings section it out. I'm just going to focus on finding one today. I just want to make sure that part's written. And, you know, it doesn't have to be great or pretty, just it needs to be written and then move on to maybe your second finding. And then once you complete it, then maybe you can go back to finding one and do your edits. So small sections wins the race. Um, if you are on a project that um, it might have some longevity to it, be consistent with your pseudonyms because this is also a way where people kind of start to identify you with certain works. So um, uh, for, for example, like I've been in MySpace for six years. So whatever names and pseudonyms I use, I'm consistently using those throughout, like from when I was a student, when I wrote my dissertation to now doing publications, I'm using pretty much, you know, same pseudonyms for the same people to build like familiarity with the programs. So keep that in the back of your mind, be consistent when you're naming stuff. Um, second, if you are writing with people, make sure there's a consistency among all the different writers. So um, for example, as I just told you, certain sections, I really like to write certain ones, not as much as others. So if I'm writing with someone and let's say I've done the findings and discussion and then they've agreed to do the intro and the literature review, you want to be sure that you read each other's parts. Don't just leave them to it because also in an article, you want to make sure there's like consistent language. And, you know, if they're referring to everything as STEM club and then I'm referring to everything as STEM program, that could cause some confusion for the reader. So you just want to be sure that, you know, everything is in alignment and that your articles are consistent. And then lastly, have someone else read it. Um, again, we spend a lot of time with our colleagues. Everyone kind of knows what we're doing in our department. So sometimes when we ask the people we're with all the time to read stuff, it's still helpful, but I like to get like outside eyes on it because um, I ran into this a lot kind of with my advisor. I mean. Granted, it's super helpful, but she's so familiar with my work. Like, let's say I wasn't being very specific with something. She, since she knows my work, she can make the jump of what I'm saying. She's like, oh, okay. Now, I might ask someone at a completely different university to read over it. And then they might say, oh, what exactly is this? What's happening there? And it just, you know, gives it gives me a, another set of eyes on it. So I can see where I need to, like, specifically write something out so that someone else can understand what was happening because again we're spending so much time with our own work it just becomes second nature to us so it can be hard for us to you know when someone says that doesn't make sense it could be hard for us to see it because you know if you ask me during my dissertation process 
I understood everything that was happening in that, you know, all those papers, but other people didn't. I understood it, but this is why I had other people read it. So then I could go back and like specify certain things. 